I'm Ann Akabori, the author of The Gift, the story of Consul Sugihara, who saved over 6,000 Jews during the Holocaust, and Tape with Rabbi Doug is next. We're going to see Rabbi Doug. We're going to see Rabbi Doug. We're going to see Rabbi Doug on your TV tonight. But Daddy, I want to watch Monday Night Football. Forget about Monday Night Football. There's no other thing we're going to watch on Monday but Rabbi Doug. Shalom and welcome to Tape with Rabbi Doug. Glad you could be with us today. My guest today is author Anne Akabari. She is the author of the book, The Gift of Life. And this is a book which is uh, the story of Chiuna Sugihara. And uh, Chiuna Sugihara was um, the council, the deputy council to Lithuania during World War II. Um, he, it was prior to World War II. From prior to World War II. It, into World War II, and he was actually uh, credited with saving thousands of lives. Over two thousand, I believe, is is a number that I that I saw. Is there an actual exact number? Uh, there is not an exact number, but the exact list consists of two thousand one hundred and thirty nine names. Two thousand one hundred thirty nine. But that's not the whole story because on that list, each name could have stood for three or four people because families. it in included the family. So the best estimate would be over 6,000. Over 6,000 people yes. from those two. I didn't know about the names being over mm -hmm. 2,000. Over 6,000 people. And um, Chiuna Sugihara, in his position of deputy counsel to Lithuania, um, was approached by mainly Jewish uh, refugees who were scared not only of the Russian occupation and control of Lithuania, but of the possible and eventual, obviously, uh, German occupation as, as World War II uh, you know, came to a head in Lithuania. And at the same time, uh, probably maybe the worst country for anti-Semitism in all of Europe possibly was Lithuania at that time. So he really uh, did save lives, obviously, that, that would have died in the Holocaust. Um, certainly the people, uh, the rest of the country, uh, who did not get out, who he wasn't able to save, almost every single one of them lost their lives uh, from the Jewish population and of those uh, non-Aryan, I don't know how, to, how else mm -hmm. to put it, in those times, uh, population who, who were kind of ignored by Hitler's army when they came into power. Um, and your book, The Gift of Life, tells the story of, of uh, Sugihara, and your connection to him is really through his son. Is that correct? Yes, it is. How did you get to know his son? Has son passed away since? He has. He passed away in the year 2001 from cancer. And what was his name? His name was Hiroki, but his, to the last day before he passed away, his mother always called him Puppe, which in German means little doll, which was quite embarrassing for him when he would have guests and suddenly his mother would pop up and say Puppe uh -huh. and, and if anyone understood German that means little doll and how did he get that name? He got that name because as they were en route to Helsinki going across the Atlantic uh, Ocean they were on a ship called the, um, um, now that escapes me but in, anyway they were on the ship that, were, that was uh, occupied mostly by Germans uh, uh, uh -huh. and they used to see Sugihara carrying this little baby and said Puppe, meaning what a cute little baby. Mm -hmm. And the family liked that name, and they just stuck to Adopted it. Adopted it and, to it. And right. So I did write a children's book called Puppe's Story. Really? So um, your connection to him, you became very good friends. He came to a school in, in, in the town where I grew up, oh, Sacramento, California. Sacramento. Now, you're Japanese-American, is that yes, correct? Yes, I am. I'm third generation third Japanese. Third generation. Um, I have a very good friend who is a, a television uh, uh, personality. I think she's originally from California, also Japanese American, and uh, she she works uh, at uh, Channel 11 in Chicago, and uh, I know her very well. Uh, she's told me so many stories about the the the, the camps and, and all the things that her family went through. Um, you, your family, how did they end up uh, coming to America originally? Well, originally, uh, since I'm third generation, my grandfather, um, he was uh, hired as an agent by the Japanese government to recruit people to uh, um, work in Hawaii as in, on the plantations. So 
he was able to bring back groups of people to Hawaii to work on the plantation. In fact, quite a few people who probably live in Hawaii were probably brought on, on those ships early, uh, in the late 1800s. But he had the opportunity to find out a little bit about America and decided to live in America for a while. And that's how he started his family in California. Now, I know that uh, Sugihara, that he was, uh, after, after Lithuania, he, he was in another country. He was, he was kind of traveling around. He ended up back in Japan. He ended up in Russia eventually, in Moscow. Uh, you know, he was sort of uh, demoted or lost his, his prestige because of the things he did and, mm -hmm. and, and doing it against the Japanese government's uh, approval and so on and so forth. How did you meet his son? How did you become friendly with his son? I know you were like a brother and sister sort of friendly. You were very, very close with well, the friendship that you had. How did you become so close to him and, and get to know the whole story about his father and the legacy? Well, first of all, he, he did come to Sacramento, and we met uh, by chance at some kind of a social gathering. And um, um, because he, he was eager to learn English and I was eager to learn Japanese because I didn't know how to speak Japanese, by chance, we just decided to become friends, and I invited him to my house, and he really liked my father, and we had a lot in common because my father himself had learned uh, to uh, speak Russian when he was going to school, and there was just this kind of a bonding because uh, my father understood about his father, the kind of person he was, and, and Hiroki felt comfortable with my family, and we just got to know each other very well. And at that point in time, uh, he did, it was in the early 60s, he did not ever tell me about this issue about his father rescu rescuing Jews because at that time his father didn't know if those visas that he had issued had saved anybody. It took him 28 years after the fact to find out that after all he did actually save thousands of lives and um, a mathematician recently um, uh, figured that at this point in time there are well over a hundred thousand survivors and descendants because of this one man. Now, uh, Sugihara is the only Japanese person being honored uh, in the Yad Vashem uh, that's true. Uh, Holocaust Museum in Israel uh, for saving Jews as, as the righteous Gentiles as they say. Um, he also you know, has been honored by those people who he saved, I know. And even after his death, his wife was brought to Israel with the family and honored at the Mir Yeshiva uh, by the survivors of, of the visas from Sugihara. Did you ever meet his wife before she passed away? She's alive. Oh, she's still I alive. I see her all the time. I did not know. <laughs> see, I did not know that. Uh -huh. I wasn't clear. Mm -hmm. I thought the son passed away. I didn't. Mm -hmm. How old is she? She's going to be 94 in December. 94. Oh, very nice. Mm -hmm. So she is living where now? Yeah, in she's Japan? in a nursing home in a wheelchair, but she has very, she's a very strong person. And in Japan? Yes. Now you actually, so this is a wonderful thing. Her memoirs, which were published, you were the translator, weren't you? Right. She wrote a memoir in Japanese, and that's how I began to learn how to speak Japanese. And my father had always insisted that I at least learn to read and write the language, and mm -hmm. so I had a little bit of background. Uh -huh. And for that reason, Hiroki uh, asked me to help him find a, a translator, and we met many people, but there were, they were he couldn't afford to pay in those times even $10,000 or $5,000. And so he, he always for some reason felt that he wanted me to do it originally, but I said, I'm not a writer, I'm a school teacher. Mm -hmm. So I didn't, know, but I was uh, trying very hard to find somebody, and I read some of the people who wanted to do it, but I just knew they did not understand the nuances and the, the true meaning of what Mrs. Sugihara meant, knowing a little bit of Japanese, and it's hard for a we Westerner to really get the exact nuance, her, her rhythm, her... Um, uh, the true slangs and right like that. uh huh wow 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 so, so I ended up doing it and at that time I said don't write my name on it because I'm embarrassed so you know it's so not very many people know about it but he was very happy with it she's 94 mm -hmm. years old living in a nursing home in Japan yes in Japan mm -hmm. very interesting now is she considered to be now in Japan in in the new age of things now is she considered to be a, a hero in Japan or is she still uh, someone who, because her husband was kind of uh, uh, shied away from, uh, also shied away from. There's a, a part of the population who really regards, regards her highly, but she's not like, has a real high profile. And mm -hmm. in fact, 
I don't think most of the people do, don't even realize she's living, mm -hmm. nor do they realize she's in a nursing home. As myself, I didn't know she was still mm -hmm. living. There was nothing clear mm -hmm. to tell me that uh, in my research. So that's, that's wonderful, just wonderful. And you know her very well. Oh, yes. Every time I go there, um, I do visit her. And um, the last time I visited her, she was in very good spirits. And she says, when are you going to come back? Oh, wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful. Now, uh, the, the Chuna's uh, biography, which is here in your book, uh, is the only authorized biography of his life because you actually uh, cooper uh, cooperated with the family in putting this together. Is Especially that the eldest son who passed away in the uh -huh. year 2001. Uh -huh. We worked many hours together before his passing, and he showed me documents. He, he really thought out everything he thought would be important, and I have some significant things about his life that until this book was published, no one would have known anything so about. Tell us, tell us about Chuna Sugihara. What was, uh, what was his motivation, first of all? Because he's most famous because he saved all these people um, against, the, against the odds, against what the J Japanese government was, was, was directing mm -hmm. him to do in his position in Lithuania at that time. What was it about him? What, what was he thinking, and, and why did he really do this? I don't like to use the word motivation. Uh -huh. He just did it because, and he really meant it. He simply said, it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if I could categorize his, that as a motivation. Righteous, righteous Gentile? Right. That's what they call him, the right. Yavashem? That's what he, he was. He was a righteous person. Mm -hmm. So he did what, what he thought was right. His motivation was doing what was right. Right. Very interesting. And I was talking with, you know, Brian is the person who introduced mm -hmm. me to you. Uh, he couldn't understand it either. We were discussing this on the car. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think a lot has to do with his upbringing as coming from uh, samurai roots. Mm -hmm. And as a samurai, a true samurai, it's not the kind of samurai we were, are talking about when you see the movies with the sword fighting and all that type of thing. It's more of a philosophy of life. And I think he understood that the most precious thing anyone ever has is life. Mm -hmm. And most samurai who understand that truly understand that you have to wor uh, uh, live a worthy life. In order to wor uh, live a worthy life, you have to be well physically, mentally, but his mother also emphasized that you have to be clean, spiritually uh -huh. centered. And I think he, it became a part of him. Uh -huh. And I think when the opportunity came, and another thing about a samurai is that uh, if you live a good life, we all die. Uh -huh. We're all gonna die. So what better time than to die is to die and not be afraid to die is when you're doing something worthy. Mm -hmm. So death was not a, uh, any consequence for him because he knew eventually everybody's going to die. Sure. And he thought, he was just proud that at the time when he was given this opportunity, he found the courage to follow through. Right, right, wonderful. I, you mentioned Brian, and I, I want to mention Brian also. So I grew up... Uh, with Brian Pakelny. We are childhood friends. We grew up on the same street in the same neighborhood. And his father, Leon, and we're family friends from the same synagogue and growing up, um, was saved by a visa from Chuna Sugihara. And uh, it's just to have someone who I know who actually is a descendant, uh, the son of a survivor in, in that uh, pretense is, is, is just an amazing thing. And I know Brian is the one who introduced me to you and, and brought you here. You spent the day with the Israeli consulate, with the Japanese consulate today. Um, do you travel around uh, meeting with uh, consulates in different cities and Whenever different I areas? Whenever I have the opportunity to let them know what I'm doing. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So tell me, tell me but what you're doing. Could I get back to Brian oh, oh, right now? Oh, please do, please do. Because, you know, the title of my uh, book is The Gift. Mm -hmm. Brian is one of the, the gifts. He, there, I see how well he takes care of his, his father. He goes there every day to visit him. He took off two days from his job to drive me around, uh -huh. and it, it's, it's, that's also a gift. He may have given the gift of life, but because of people like Brian, uh -huh. you know, he goes to his work every day and he do, does his job, he's really a gift to his father. It's, it, the whole thing is, a, if you think about it, yeah, you know, because of thing. life. It's a and thing. it's significant that I, I'm bringing the story to this area because I would say, including Brian and his family, there are some uh, very stellar people who were saved by Sugihara, like Leo Malamud, who mm -hmm. was involved with the uh, Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and I don't know if you know about uh, uh, Samuel Zell, his family, he, they're pretty well known, mm -hmm. his family, and a very good friend of mine, uh, his name is um, Rick Solomon, 
I've met his children. Definitely, if uh, Sugi Hauer were alive and were able to meet them, he would say, this was really a gift. I saved Rick's father. And look at his children, be two beautiful children who are doing well, contributing to this society. I know in the PBS video uh, that you were involved with producing with them, um, there was a, a gentleman on who was saved by Sugihara, and he brought all his children and grandchildren, 37 descendants from, from that one visa. I thought, oh, how moving, you know, just the, the, the numbers of people that were... Uh, that were saved by one visa, you know, for the future. It's, so you could believe that over a hundred thousand now, you can't can you? You can believe that there's over a hundred thousand. Uh -huh. Absolutely, it's it's an amazing thing. You are the founder of an organization called Visas for Life Foundation. Actually, the eldest son is the founder, and I helped him. You together did mm -hmm. that. Uh -huh. And after okay. he passed away, I I inherited the, the it's, uh, it's, volunteer organization. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> and the idea of of the foundation is to perpetuate the humanitarian legacy of Chuna Sugihara and, and what he did. And tell me, what does the organization do now in, in its uh, existence, Visas for Life Foundation? Well, we think that his life story is like a role model for people to listen to and remember. It also is a good story for uh, Holocaust deniers. Mm -hmm. It's coming from somebody like that. He has no nothing to gain by saying all this happened. And I, I understand, even in, in the, my town, we had an incident about Holocaust deniers and uh, an amazing story like that weakens anybody who has any point of saying that. But more than anything else, I think that uh, I've, you've heard this cliche quite often, one man can make a difference, and <laughs> this story clearly shows that. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm here uh, with Ann Akabari. She is the author of The Gift of Life, the story of Chiuna Sugihara. And uh, we're here on Taped with Rabbi Doug, and we'll be right back in just a moment. Don't go away. Taped with Rabbi Doug will be right back. Finally, at the end of July 1940, Sugihara agreed to issue the transit visas. For the next four weeks, Sugihara worked tirelessly to fulfill their requests, issuing hundreds of transit visas a day. I'd say more than half of them had no passport. Under the conditions they had to deal with when they left their homeland, it seemed understandable. So we accepted anything, even blank sheets of paper with Curacao, no visa required, handwritten as a destination. I'm meteorologist Rick DeMaio, and you're watching Taped with Rabbi Doug. Welcome back to Taped with Rabbi Doug. I'm here with uh, Ann Akabari, author of The Gift of Life, and uh, she is the uh, chairperson of Visas for Life Foundation as well. And, uh, and the story is an amazing story about Chuna Tsugihara. What does it mean to you as a Japanese-American, uh, and maybe even to your family and the people you know who are Japanese-Americans, to be involved in, in uh, a Japanese hero's uh, life story? Well, in a sense, it was um, almost like an epiphany for me because uh, growing up as an American, uh, people of my contemporaries, we kind of felt guilty about the bombing of Pearl Harbor. We had nothing to do with it. We were here for like third generation. But to hear that out of all of this came a hero like Sugihara, it made us want to embrace this person and, and let people know that here was a more positive story about what happened that came out of World War II. Mm -hmm. Because you hear so much about the military um, actions. Now, the, the, the story goes into such depth where uh, people would have had to have an exit visa and an entrance visa and a, a, a travel visa. And the people who left Lithuania had to travel by train. They had to get, I understand, $180 in American dollars to be able to buy the ticket along with to be allowed to get the visa to begin with. And they, they travel by train all the way across Russia, which is, what, 900 miles or, I, I, I'm sorry, thousands of miles. Right. I don't mean 900. It's further Not, than uh, from California right. to New York. Thousands of miles. Mm -hmm. uh, I, don't, I don't know how many, 6,000, 7,000 miles maybe across Russia. I would say about 8,000. 8,000 mm -hmm. 8, miles. And I understand when, when I said the word 900, I meant the complete trip by the time they got to Japan and went by boat was almost 9,000 miles, I was told. And they, they went and they had to 
then they had to be able to get on the boat and go from the uh, Russia. I don't remember the name of the city. Uh, Kobe. Go, mm -hmm. And they had to take the boat and they went to Japan. And there was a community. Oh, of Vladivostok. They had to leave Vladivostok and go to Suruga Port in Japan. Uh -huh. And then from there they went to Kobe. And they, they created a Jewish community in Japan. It was already there. There was one already. Mm -hmm. There was one already. And they joined that Jewish community, these uh, 2,000 families or so they came there. And uh, then the Germans came in and wanted the Jewish people to be rounded up. They, they wanted that to happen. And the story goes, as I understand, that uh, the uh, leaders in the Jewish community convinced the Japanese officials that the Germans were going to turn on them next because they weren't Aryan either. Right. And uh, they, they, for that reason, they allowed the Jewish people to live their lives there in Japan. And No, they didn't. They were sent to uh, Shanghai. Shanghai. Right. Shanghai before that, before mm -hmm. that, they were told. And the, what, the, I wanted to go into the Shanghai story because this is such an amazing thing. Um, they, when the Germans already made their alliance with Japan in World War II and things were getting rough, they sent the Jews to Shanghai to, to be saved, and there was a Jewish community, a, a Jewish yeshiva, the Mir Yeshiva, which now is in Jerusalem, that, that was established in Shanghai for that whole time. The saving of all these people, the establishment of the Shanghai Jewish community uh, from these people. How did the Japan? and I know, by the way, a lot of the Jewish people got there because of the Joint Distribution Committee, right. got the money to them, right. uh, you know, to help the Jewish people get there. How did these people transfer in the middle of World War II from Japan to, to Shanghai? That's my question. It, because, it's such uh, an amazing thing. There's so many. How did the money come? How did they get there? How did that all take place? I would have to say you have to give the credit to the Japanese government because Shanghai was the, uh, uh, taken over by Japan by that time. And, and they were the amazing part of this story is they protected them there because uh, one of the emissaries of uh, Hitler went to Shanghai and asked a foreign minister whose name was uh, Matsuoka, in fact, I should also mention at this point that Matsuoka was educated at a university in Oregon, so he mm -hmm. had some American background. But uh, he refused him, and his answer was, uh, we may have uh, formed an alliance w with you, but we never promised to be anti-Semitic, mm -hmm. and kept them there in safety and didn't return them. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Just amazing. There, uh, that's why the story is so important, because there are so many aspects of it that bring out uh, parts of history that is not known. In fact, um, I would say a, another good part of the story for the Japanese people to realize if they, I'm sure they're w aware of it, but I, uh, uh, Sugihara uh, really representing, re represented a faction that was against any alliance with Germany. They, they didn't want to be involved in a war. Uh, what, what drove them was the mil militaristic takeover. Mm -hmm. And when Sugihara Another aspect of his, he always believed that as a representative of his government, he was actually representing the people. And he felt no comms in saying the right thing to do was to save the people because he knew that in his heart. When you get down to the grassroots, none of them would have said, go and help them. They, he w they would have done, said to him, do exactly what you did do. Mm -hmm. Because for him, it, he was representing the people, not the military. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you about Ann Akabori because you said you, were, you weren't a writer, you were a school teacher. How did you come to actually write a book and, and such a detailed book as you did about uh, Sugihara? Obviously, there's a lot of research, not only getting to know his son and being friends with him and, and the family, but uh, it, it takes a, a great deal of, of work to put together a book like this, and you did it. How did you become an author? It's because I was given the story, and it was a gift to me. And I felt that since I had such a pre precious gift, what's, what's the best way to, to share this gift is by writing a book like this so other people can enjoy the gift that I got about mm -hmm. knowing about the family and the story. Uh -huh. what, what would you say uh, in, in Sugihara's life, what would you say is uh, the, the high point uh, that you talk about in the book? You mean of his personal of life? his personal life, yeah. Probably, although he never wanted to have uh, attention about what he did because for him it was a personal decision, mm -hmm. probably for himself personally, it was that, and he did say this, that he only cherished the fact that at the time when it was called upon him to do something right, he found a little bit of courage in him to, do, to be able to do it when it was needed. Mm -hmm. I think I would say that. 
because he did mean that but after that he said i don't want to talk about it i did i just cherish the fact that i did it because he admitted he's not always a brave man he never claimed to be a hero or anything like that he just cherish the fact that he did it when it was needed. Wonderful, wonderful. Where are his children that are surviving and his grandchildren and great-grandchildren probably by now, I would guess, maybe? Yes. Where are they now? Uh, he has uh, two grandchildren, great-grandchildren, uh -huh. living in um, Tokyo. Uh -huh. And I'm not sure, I think he has about five or four living in Antwerp, Belgium. Uh -huh. This was is by the son who um, was born after all of this happened when they returned to Japan. Was, was he ever recognized in Lithuania after the fact? Oh yes, they have a street named after him uh -huh. and they still have that uh, consulate. Uh -huh. I think they're using that bil building currently as a museum uh -huh. in his honor. Very nice, mm -hmm. very nice. I, I can't tell you how, how happy I am that you are here in Chicago and that you were able to come and visit me. I, I want to thank Brian Pekelny and Leon Pekelny, his father who's the survivor uh, for for bringing you to my attention and and you know this is a story that many people know bits and pieces they know about the Shanghai Jewish community mm -hmm. they know that these were people who were saved from the Holocaust but they don't know the details of, of Sugihara and how how they ended up there and it's just uh, wonderful that you've been able not only to bring it to our viewers attentions but uh, to be able to bring it to the attention of the world community uh, with your book the gift of life and with the PBS video that you were involved in, the, the documentary, which really tells the story of, of Sugihara so well as uh, uh, in detail with pictures and, and, and uh, uh, shows his family and his wife and the interviews. And it's just an amazing piece that's, that's been put together. And you're just an amazing person. Well, you are, and I really thank you for bringing this, uh, giving me the opportunity to be here. And I, it's a privilege for me to have well. met you. I wish you much success with The Gift of Life by Anne Akabori. I want to thank you for being on the show. I want to thank you, our viewers, for being with us. Remember, we are on every week at this time. If you want to find out more about Anne Akabori, you can visit our website, www.tvrabbi.com, or drop me an email at info at tvrabbi.com. Once again, I want to thank my guest, Anne Akabori, the author of The Gift of Life, and uh, I want to thank all of you for being with us. Remember, we're on every week at this time, so I hope to see you next time right here on Taped with Rabbi Doug. Shalom. See you.